All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined all the way from Minnesota by Ryan Tanson. How are you doing, Ryan? Good, John. How are you, my friend? Excellent, excellent. And Ryan uh, started his entrepreneurial career at his family business where he was EVP and responsible for strategic operation financial growth of the $21 million company. And by 27 had helped the, turn the company around, brought intentional focus to the right strategies, which enabled it to be sold for eight figures in 2014. I see. So we have another young overachiever here. <laughs> <laughs> but without, without a lot of, uh, it was it was thrown into the deep end, my friend. Yeah, I love it, love it. <laughs> and then you took that experience to uh, and founded Arcona to create it, the intentional growth framework, which helps uh, hope owners view and run the company like a financial asset through educational training and fractional CFO services. And your mission is to help entrepreneurs enjoy, create wealth, enjoy work, create wealth, and make impact make the journey worth it so you've worked with over 400 entrepreneurs and you have your own intentional growth podcast and what we're going to talk about today is the five principles of intentional growth and i think this great subject ryan uh as you get into just baseline what you mean by intentional because that's a word that's been thrown around a lot now you've i mean you've been doing this for a while so you're probably like oh so now everybody's jumping on the intentional <laughs> kind of, wagon right what i feel like hey we're gonna be talking about ice baths and meditation yeah. no, <laughs> um, so just honestly, baseline I'm, intentionality it's it's about doing things on purpose because you have a clearly identified outcome john it's just it's by understanding why you're doing what you're doing because it's getting you closer to your goals. Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great one. Cause I, I love that. Why? Because I do think a lot of people don't know their why have never asked about, have never asked themselves about their why have never worked with somebody like you to understand or discover their why. So I mean, let's, let's, let's get into it about the, the five uh, principles of intentional growth and, and maybe talk a little bit about why the why, why the why, why the why is so important. So uh, John, when we, when I started in the family business, um, we, so is it normal for me to only look at myself? Like yeah, it's, yeah. Okay. I was like, I didn't know if it was being done right. Okay. Um, I, I would say like what the reason for the five principles, John, is because the, when I, when I started in the family business, we were doing 20 million in revenue and we were just doing things like the goal was, and I will call that we had a lifestyle business versus solving for an actual mm -hmm. valuable company because the, the decision lens that we had, John, is that we were trying to solve for annual cash flow. So, Mm -hmm. our, our thought process is how much money can we suck out of this company through salary distributions and perks? It wasn't like, Hey, if we invest in this sales and marketing strategy or put this ERP system in, or, in, you know, build out our management team like this, what will the company be worth? It was just truly sucking it out for cash flow. Mm -hmm. So the five intentional growth principles is about shifting our mindset away from that lifestyle business more towards what is this asset going to be worth and tying that, that goal, and integrating our life and the business at the same time. And the reason I say that, John, is because the, I'll go through the five principles. The first one is, what is your vision for the business? Like, what do you want for your leadership role versus your ownership? Because, you know, a lot of times we start out, we have a job in the business, mm -hmm. but if it grows big enough, we might not have to have a job. Well, we can still keep the company. So what do you want out of your leadership role as it evolves over time? And then what do you want for your stakeholders over time, regardless of who owns or runs the company? So like once you're clear on your vision, then you can move to principle two to say, okay, well, what are your financial targets? And so there are three financial targets. The first one we have to identify is what is our target annual income that we want? So as a business owner and leader, we have to say, okay, well, how much cash flow does this company need to mm. provide to us, regardless of whether we own it or not, in order to live the lifestyle that we want? So we have to solve for that annual cash flow. Then we can say, okay, well, what is our, the second one is, uh, second target is our outside net worth, which will, impact our decisions. So it's just about calibrating where we're at. So our outside net worth, if we have a bunch of money, we don't need to sell the company. Right. But if we do <clears throat> not, excuse me, if we don't have a bunch of money, then we're going to grow the value. And that leads us to the third uh, financial target, which is what is the target equity? That's really important. The equity valuation that we want for the company at a point in time. And then what is the cash flow that we want on the way there? So for example, what's the target normalized EBITDA, essentially mm -hmm. cash flow that you want. And then how much cash flow do you want on the way to getting to that cash flow valuation? 
Right. So that just helps us understand the, the financial targets. And then the third principle, John, is your exit options. There are five of them. We don't have to get too much into them, but sure. ESAP, private equity, strategic, internal, or acquisition entrepreneur, each one of those exit options will impact the valuation, when and how you get your money and your control post-closing. So understanding that is important. So when you get to your point B, you're like, what options do I want? You don't have to take mm -hmm. them, but let's create as many options as possible because I think options is freedom. Principle four is about growing value so that once you know what your, your target is, that goal that we just talked about, then that then it's the purposeful action. Like we want to be de-risking the cash flow mm -hmm. all the way towards that valuation. And if we have that lens, John, it's different than like my dad and I, where it was sucking cash out. It should be more about how do we invest in strategies that de-risk that cash flow so we have the mm -hmm. highest probability of getting that valuation when we want, how we want it. And then the fifth principle is the team of advisors. And think about those people as your banker, your CPA, yeah. your wealth manager, and all the consultants like yourself or myself on the finance side, you on the sales and marketing side saying, okay, all of these advisors should be providing advice through the lens of your target valuation and your timeline and your ability to invest in the company mm -hmm. and then helping you optimize the plan to get there. So long story short, John, it's truly a purposeful, purposeful action to a, towards a clearly identified outcome. And honestly, man, all I just want for everybody is to say, here's what I did, why yeah. I did it, here's whether it worked or did not work, and here's what I did about it. And right. they're just, I don't know, <laughs> not, <laughs> guess, not guessing. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I, 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 I love what you're outlining here. Uh, and if you, if we go back, I mean, the first thing is, as you said, is the vision and the leadership and stuff. Sometimes when people start businesses or entrepreneurs, when they get into it, they get so consumed in the idea and the business that they kind of lose sight of why they wanted to do it in the first place, or they didn't define properly why they wanted to do it in the first place. Oh my gosh. It's so true, John. And like, I'd say a lot of people, because I, I mean, actually, to, to prove your point on the podcast uh, for years, I had asked people, so why did you become an entrepreneur? And they're like, I never wanted, I, it just happened. It was an accident. I quit asking it because it was like most of the time, if I were to sum it up, it, I don't know if you're familiar with Dan Sullivan. He talked about the four freedoms, yeah. uh, his strategic coach, freedom of time, freedom of money, freedom of purpose, freedom of relationships. Essentially, people just want to do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. But you need to be making money on the way. So like, I, I think a lot of times people get into it for freedom or control, but then the <laughs> company sucks them up and like it, it consumes them because in the early stages, you have to like, it's all consuming. But then as the company grows, you can decouple yourself if you have a good plan. Yeah. So I think it's like a lot of times the company does the opposite because it's sucking out, it's sucking in cash and sucking yeah. in time. But hopefully it's for a return. And if you don't have that framework I'm talking about, it just is kind of hoping that it all works out. Yeah. And and, and like you said, your second one around uh, uh, around stakeholders and even cash flow, because cash flow is a really interesting one, isn't it? Like liquidity, because I think that's the thing that, that comes back to bite a lot of uh, businesses when they start or entrepreneurs, because maybe they overestimate how much revenue they can generate in the first year or two, or worse, they kind of don't legislate for the fact that guess what you may be selling loads but you're not actually collecting the money people aren't paying you on time and suddenly you're going hang on i've got i've got all this revenue but i've got no money in the bank oh if, <laughs> there are there are two comments that i get a universal laughter at john when i do my keynotes mm -hmm. one is i go hey have you ever uh said anybody i say usually i say something like raise your hand if you've her, if you've heard yourself say this, I'm growing like gangbusters and I have no cash. <laughs> and like, yeah, because growth is expensive and we can talk about why. Mm -hmm. Or the second is my CPA said I did amazing this year, but my tax bill is a quarter million bucks and I have no cash. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, just because your income statement says you got a, you know, a profit does not mean you have any cash. I don't know what you, John, but you can't, I, I've, you can't pay payroll with payables. And yep. receivables yeah, and yeah. inventory and that's a use of cash so i say that because under like over the last 15 years people just looked at their income statement man and it was a pretty consistent world for a long time and now with supply chain interest rate issues labor issues yeah. you know you name it they're having to look at their cash flow statement and a lot of people forgot about that statement 
Yeah, and it's yeah, you're you're hundred percent right, and particularly with the the end of cheap money now, so it's not so easy to suddenly go out and supplement or get your line of credit extended or whatever, or even mm-hmm. if you do, the cost of it then has obviously gone up with the with the interest rates. It's also interesting your third one there around the the exit strategy because again, I think this is something that sometimes you get into something, but you have no you have really have no target. Yeah, you want to build a business you want to do, but you really really don't know. I mean, are you going to stay there forever? Are you going to hand it off to your kids? Is it a legacy? Do you want to sell it? What what do you want to do? And I think if it's one of those things like if you don't know where you're going, kind of any path will take you there. 100%, John. And I think it I, I don't think we have to overcomplicate it either yeah. because I think it's very similar to your house. All people want to do is live in a good house, right? Mm-hmm. But like they also want it to appreciate in value and have choices when they want to sell it. Right. But how many people do we know that put a hundred, 200, 300 grand in a million dollars the month they just sell it to make the beautiful house they wish they would have lived in for 40 years and then they sell it. And yeah. it's like, so I say that because we don't know what we're going to do with our house, how we're going to sell it. Is, is it going to be an ash, all cash offer? Is mm-hmm. it going to be, you know, part debt, part equity? Is it going to be my kids? Is it going to be a renter? I mean, like the goal is to have all those choices, but you have to have a good house to have all those choices. And so I think the goal is just like with our, like if people actually like lived in their house correctly, they would allocate a certain amount of uh, money to remodeling and updating it every year that no one really does. But your business is the same way. It's like, how much should we invest to keep appreciating this valuable company and then have as many choices? So, and I think one of the reasons, John, that people don't do this is because at least with a house, we know that your master bath, your, your, Mm -hmm. your kitchen, your open floor concept, certain things that are just, understood to grow value but with a business people you don't universally understand how valuations work so mm-hmm. how are we supposed to make decisions on growing value if we don't know how what grows value yeah. or how valuations work so then a lot of people are just guessing which is why they default to revenue and i can tell you when i joined in the family business we were doing 21 million in revenue we had 115 employees and we lost nine hundred forty thousand dollars in 09 uh, well, the year I joined um, because of the financial crisis, yep. my dad had been distant for the company. And I can tell you, if we were to sell the business in 09, John, we would owe the bank two and a half million bucks. Yep. So yep. 21 million in revenue, lost 940 grand, we would owe the bank money. So like revenue really isn't <laughs> the end goal that we should be marching towards. Yeah, I love that idea of, uh, the, you know, the concept of of value, because I think that's something that people struggle about. Like they hear about it all the time. They're always hearing about, you know, you, you need to create value in your business. You need to create value that, you know, potential buyers or investors will understand, will will be able to appreciate, will be able to quantify and be able to run through their models. Uh, but if you don't know how they work, then it's how do you how do you map to it? Yeah, right. It's almost impossible. And just to plant a seed for the listeners, there's two numbers that that equal the value of a company. It's normalized EBITDA, mm-hmm. which is a proxy for cash flow. And we could talk about seller's discretionary earnings or EBIT or normal. I mean, but all we're trying to get to is the annual cash flow of a company. Mm-hmm. That, that's what everybody needs to understand, which is usually through normalized EBITDA. And the second one is that multiple that people here talk about all the time. And most people think that it comes out of people's butts at conference shows or whatever, you know, conversation at that uh, country club. But the multiple comes from the the buyer's perception of risk. So if someone says like, hey, John, you have a million dollars in normalized EBITDA, so a million dollars in annual cash flow and the multiples of five, what someone's saying. So if it's me, John, I'm effectively saying, John, I'm willing to give you five years of cash flow for your business because of the risk. But I'm not willing to give you your six and seven because I've got concerns about the story you told me. Mm-hmm. But if I'm willing to, if someone else is willing to give you a three, it's because they don't understand or they don't have confidence in years four and five. Right. That's it, man. Like, so let's let's de-risk the cash flow to get more a higher multiple. And then you can always increase the cash flow, which also helps <laughs> increase yeah. the value. And the, the third component, John, that you mentioned. So we talked about increase the normalized EBITDA, the cash flow, increase the multiple by de-risking that cash flow, and then manage your debt, pay down your debt. So that's where the equity valuation comes in. Instead of just the loose value term, like you mentioned, I don't want my house to be worth a million if I owe 2 million on it. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Who cares? Yeah. It is so interesting though, because uh, I've been through a couple of acquisitions myself in the past and done so, and it's, and tried to acquire some, some businesses 
And when you sometimes when you have a model and you know you do the valuation, like you said, and then you present what you value their business at, and they're shocked, and there's such a gap between their expectation and where you are, and you can't find you can't figure out where is this Why? extra money that you think you, we should be giving you? Because I mean, I always did very, very fair valuations and there was a model. Well, here's what happens, John, honestly, at the lower end of the market, it's yeah. like, Oh, so John wants $4 million for his company. The thing mm -hmm. kicks out 250 grand. Well, it all here's, <laughs> and I'm saying this just because we're making sure. up this, the fiction, this yeah, fictitious yeah. situation, but effectively what I hear when I hear that, is we got a $250,000 paycheck and seller's discretion earning that goes to John. John's got a job that has 60, that takes 60 hours a week, has a lot of people, a lot of personal guarantees, and a lot of headaches, and he makes a quarter million bucks. John wants me to write him a check for $4 million to get a 60 hour a week job with personal guarantees and headaches. Mm -hmm. Why in the <laughs> hell would I do that? I could go put $4 million in the treasury bonds and collect 6% right now. That's <laughs> the stupidest thing ever. So like, it's a job. Like mm -hmm. unless unless you create sustainable cash flow that can be transferred. Like yeah. and like like in, in what I hear and I and, I, and my heart goes out, which is why me and my team do this because we want to help create assets for people. Is the four million dollars is your retirement amount, and yeah. you need to retire and you want to quit your job that's getting you a two hundred fifty thousand dollar paycheck and you need four to five million dollars with a six percent return to maintain your job. So like that, again, going back to the house analogy, John, if you <laughs> wanted to buy my house and it's worth a half a million dollars and I say $4 million because it's my retired amount, yeah. retirement amount. Yeah, I'd be saying, uh, which charity did you uh, mistake me for? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I, I mean, there was uh, somebody who lived near me uh, a couple of years ago and they were in kind of the situation you're talking about. They had a very good business, uh, local business, uh, probably turnover, million, million and a half, something like two million maybe. But he had a very frank conversation with me one time and he said, I can't sell it. It's not enough. It wouldn't be enough to get me through retirement. I have to keep going and I have to figure out how I can increase that. And I, and right now I don't see how. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's very common, but the, the, how people can increase it, Jen, and, and we're, well, this potentially would take us too far into the weeds, sure. but is if a business owner can see into the horizon, because well, let's talk about why people don't, why do people don't invest? Because like sales and marketing, what you do is the driver of revenue, mm -hmm. right? So yep. we we want to hit the throttle. We want to hit the gas pedal down of what you do. So it ends up in sustainable cash flow, but people don't have that connection. Mm -hmm. So like, and again, I my heart goes out to sales and marketing consultants across the world because so many owners come up and be like, I need more growth. Mm -hmm. And honestly, all I hear is I don't have enough cash flow. This thing is not worth it for me. And it's yeah. like, well, you can't put all of that burden on the sales and marketing consultant to make sure you have a sustainable cash flow machine. It's your, it's the business owner's job to figure out how those leads are profitable leads and profitable mm -hmm. clients that end up in sustainable cash flow. And so I think the, the also, other thing I would say about that is that it is possible if people project the financials and operational data into the future to say, hey, in the middle of the year, because like essentially when people don't replace themselves is because it's like, Hey, someone's finally making 150, 200 grand. And then someone goes like a consultant just says, we'll go hire a GM. It's like, I'm finally making my cash flow, like, right. or I'm making yeah. the lifestyle that I want. If I double down, that goes away. So then it's more of like, do you use your line of credit? Do you get an investor? You get some funding or do you take less cash? I mean, there's only so many ways to get that next level of growth. But I think if people see that grow, see that cash flow, not the income statement, just the income mm -hmm. statement, but yeah. the cash flow statement to say, hey, I can maintain my salary through yeah. distributions while hiring a president. The lights go off, man. And then yeah. they have a choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And then they can, as as that old saying goes, they can work on the business as opposed to in the business, et cetera, or whatever they want to do. And the last thing I, I think it's, I love the last one you have is the uh, is the advisors. Uh, because you mentioned like your, your, you know, your banker, all your accountant, all of these things, because sometimes people kind of see these as maybe not adversarial almost, but, but sort of like, Ooh, uh, I've got to call my banker rather than somebody there to support them. Yeah. I, I, I would say that it's almost 
two sides of the spectrum it's either they're they're adversarial and they don't want to like you just said like they mm -hmm. just don't feel like they're peers they don't get it there's a lot of reasons for that that mm -hmm. that, that it could be true but also the opposite which is people blindly believe their advisors oh. <laughs> and i just don't want people to do either i want people to own their situation just like they would when, with their doctor like mm -hmm. you're not going to go into your doctor and, and I hate that this is true in the US, but like, I don't believe any of my doctors, honestly, they just want to sell me sh stuff. Yes. And like, and it just, whether it's, it's a, what did, what did someone say? It's like cut and pills. It's like, you know what I mean? Like, that's what you're going to get. And you have to go in knowing that like, it's a hip doctor or a knee doctor or a back doctor. And like, that's what they're there for. They're not going to go in there and look at the whole picture. So if people just kind of swallow that golf ball of truth and go up, no one cares about your situation as much as you do. Yeah. Then you can look at the banker through the lens of they have to make loans to make their, their mm -hmm. own paycheck. And yep. you have to look at the CPA to say they sell quality of earnings or, or audits. You look at the wealth manager to say they sell AUM. I mean, it's not good or bad. It just is what it is. But you have to be responsible for what you want and your plan. Then you surround other people and say, okay, and what am I missing? What am I missing from the tax side from the, you know, but like you have your target valuation and your timeline and your goal, then you kind of layer on the advice instead of having the advice be what dictates the goal. Yeah. And then I, I think the last part is, is then, you know, the coach or the advisor or somebody like you, who's somebody who is external, who only, who their only, inter, their only investment is in helping you. They've nothing else. They've nothing else going on it, and and somebody who you can bounce ideas off. Because I always think, it, and I say this ad nauseum, is like we invest money in our in our hobbies, right? I mean, we probably like people who are into golf are always getting golf coaches to help them and everything. And I always wonder, like, how much you how much are you investing in the stuff that puts bread on the table? I I agree, John, and like I want people to invest in the coaches too that have a it have a goal to help them succeed yep. regardless. And like, mm -hmm. I, like I, it took me nine years, man, to build my business where I didn't have a vested interest in a particular outcome. Like right. it was like my goal to make sure I could monetize the relationship on an ongoing basis, regardless of whether they drove it into the ground, sold it for a premium. I don't really care. I just want you to get what you want. So I think it's that lens. And then the second part, I know you definitely say this at nauseum is they've <laughs> done it before. Yes. They've picked up the phone. They've done the marketing. They've done the stuff because mm -hmm. like there's too many thought leaders out there that are preaching ice baths and whatever, never actually gotten in the tub. <laughs> <laughs> Ice baths, yeah. I, I'm I'm big into martial arts, but ice baths is just something I can't do. <laughs> I, I don't do them either. But I just I just say that because like you go on X or any of these social media things, and it's whatever's next, and yeah, it's like exactly. I don't know like, how many of these people have ever gotten in the arena. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the gimmicks. It's like at the end of the day, um, good practical advice from somebody who's been there and done that is worth more than the latest, whatever it is uh, <laughs> that people have come up with. Uh, listen, Ryan, this has been fantastic. Uh, but before we go, like, all of Ryan's information will be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and your business. So we've got uh, three offerings. The Arcona was uh, created in 2019 after five years of me trying to figure out how to build this in a way that actually adheres to what we were just talking about. We've got the do it yourself version. We've got an online academy with 10 hours, 72 videos, do it yourself. Um, it's for a thousand bucks or 1500 bucks. I think it is. And then, uh, or you can hire us for coaching or then there's the do it with you. We've got a financial dashboard offering and uh, where we take your, fi your financials and tie it to your goal. Just like we were talking about it comes with a couple mm -hmm. coaching calls a month. And then a fractional CFO services, but either one of those, John, we offer a complimentary financial assessment that mm -hmm. if people are interested in it, uh, all they have to do is book a discovery call with me. We'll ask some questions. And if they qualify, my team will plug in our dashboard, analyze their numbers and see if it's a fit. Just trying to figure out whether it makes sense or not. But all that stuff's on the website. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. And if you just even what you said about your online, like 1500 or whatever, I mean, you could waste that in one Google ad for a week and get no return on it. So I mean, sometimes you got to put you got to put your investments in perspective, think investing for a bigger return or investing for no return. And I, and, and the, the you know what the agreed, and that we've had like 550 some people go through that. And I, I would give it away, honestly, John, mm -hmm. if people would do the work. 
But what I realized is like, I couldn't give it away fast enough because then people wouldn't take the time to go through it. And I've had people say like, literally it saved me $15 million. And when I was eventually going to sell and I'm like, but it's, I think for the listeners and if it's like, we're doing what John said, it's learning how this works and doing the hard work will be the payoff. Absolutely. I love it. Well, listen, thanks again, Ryan. And thank you for watching and listening. See you all again soon. Yeah.